The opening of a video game is arguably one of the most important parts. You have to craft something that is well paced, captivating, establishes your world, themes and characters, all while still having it be fun and not overly reliant on constant exposition. Above all though, you have to reel players in, you have to make people want to keep playing and strap in for the long haul. There are a handful of games that I consider to have pretty damn perfect prologues. To mean, it's as close to executing everything it needs to, exactly as it needs to, without wasting an ounce of time. A few that spring to mind will be games like God of War 2018 that establishes its ideas and themes along with its two main protagonists, its core gameplay loop and has a stylish boss fight to cap it off, or something like Kingdom Hearts 2, a prologue that while somewhat unorthodox, explores the character of Roxas fully and establishes the mystery and link to Sora all before the title card drops with little fanfare after what was essentially a very self-contained tragedy. Or seemingly uh, self-contained at the time. Th things got a little bit complicated. I've explored God of War in depth, of course. Perhaps one day I'll do the same for Kingdom Hearts 2. Or at least the prologue, which is entirely underappreciated. There are countless games that might be absolutely fine, great games even, that I've tapped out of because the prologue just didn't resonate with me. It didn't do anything to make me feel, this is a game I need to play. And part of that comes from the fact that I'm so busy. If a game doesn't hit me right in the first hour or two, then I'll just stop. With video games being my job, for lack of a more elegant explanation, and with games becoming such an investment of time these days, slowly becoming longer and bigger than ever before, if you can't make me feel the desire to continue, often I just won't. I'll find something that does do that for me. Final Fantasy XVI's prologue is potentially my favourite prologue of all time, and the decision to release it as a free-to-play public demo might be one of the best business decisions of all time too. I was already going to play Final Fantasy XVI. I've been preparing for a while now, playing through all of the games on stream in order. Currently just finished up with Final Fantasy IX, a masterpiece of a game. I'll link my second channel down in the description if you want to see the video versions of these playthroughs through all of the Final Fantasy games. I'll be doing stuff for XVI there too. My demo playthrough is up right now and I, I stream them on Twitch if you want to follow me. You don't have to though. But despite the fact that I was already going to play Final Fantasy XVI, there there are plenty of people who weren't, or weren't sure about spending the money, there's a lot of games coming out this year after all, and the buzz that has been built by this demo is like nothing I've ever seen before. Friends who previously had zero interest in Final Fantasy are pumped for this game. Creators who previously haven't had a focus on Final Fantasy are seeing this game as the next big thing. The demo for Final Fantasy XVI has turned this into the biggest must-play game of 2023, and the energy from everybody surrounding this game is just incredible to immerse yourself in. I'm not sure I've seen this sort of buzz for a video game in a while, and although there have been large successes, there was extreme hype for Elden Ring and Tears of the Kingdom, but this this feels tangibly different. Final Fantasy is becoming a must-play franchise again, as it was years ago. The series in recent collective memory is something that became a bit of a cash cow, carrying weight only in name and not really in substance. Of course, there are people who love Final Fantasy XV, and XIII has its defenders, XIV is a success, but We'd be lying if we were to say that an MMO is how the mainstream consumer measures Final Fantasy's substantial merit. The honest to god truth is that Final Fantasy has not been a critically acclaimed must-play franchise in around 20 years. Audiences have felt split and the franchise started to feel more and more niche. Final Fantasy used to hold a certain level of prestige, from its infancy through to what most consider to be the Golden Age. Final Fantasy was always something to be revered, and that prestige has always been carried by the title due to its legacy. But with Final Fantasy XVI, the prestige isn't only in the title, it's seemingly within every inch of the game's DNA. It's a game that once again lives up to the title of Final Fantasy. It's once again something to be revered, as Final Fantasy should be. 
But what is it about the game's prologue that makes it to me one of, if not the greatest prologue I've ever played? I think it comes down to a perfect harmony between presentation, quality of character writing and world building, the gameplay feel and performances from the actors, all of which fire on all cylinders for the entirety of this demo to create a feeling that is hard to describe. I found myself in every single cutscene, hanging off of every word said to know what motivates these characters, how their relationships impact them, how the state of the world affects different people in different ways, and it all felt so organic and real and raw whilst also feeling deeply intriguing. It's a balancing act that not a lot of stories can nail, especially to this degree. The gameplay might be the easiest way that you can point to what the prologue manages to capture. It doesn't give you all the tools just yet, it gives you a taste of what's to come, and in doing so, it allows you to play around in a very well-equipped paddling pool that you can feel will become an ocean by the end of the game, and it's that promise and anticipation that makes it all the more fun. It feels like as we grow with Clive, the gameplay depth will grow too, and that's exciting. But it's not just that, it's the feeling of combat that's just so magnetic. The way Clive moves out of the way on a perfect dodge to return and land a blow, the particle effects on a dash or the casting of magic, the power behind your icon ability, and the thoughtfulness with how all of these elements interweave manages to make the experience itself so kinetic and dominant, while also retaining a sense of challenge which you need to overcome. Real-time action combat has never been something that fundamentally detracts from Final Fantasy, but 15's approach to it certainly did. Not because of the nature of real-time action combat, but because of its approach to how it functioned, automating dodges and attacks to remove the core element of strategy and skill that have been an important part of the makeup of Final Fantasy since its inception. 16 remedies this and makes it feel a damn joy to play with the style that 15 managed to implement as well. Every fight felt like a hype moment, something to cheer on, and that's one hell of a feat in a video game. You can really tell the developers they got on board to help from the Kingdom Hearts team, the Nier team with Platinum Games, and the combat director being from Devil May Cry 5. Not, not the game, the, uh, from the team that made the game. They've really helped to bring Final Fantasy truly into the real-time action combat genre, while, to me, retaining what made Final Fantasy's combat shine. The world building is key to any Final Fantasy. You look at Final Fantasy VII, and one of the core aspects that made it so fun to traverse that world once you leave Midgar is very subtly learning about Shimra, their greed, and their harm to the planet over the course of the first four to six hours, so that when you're set free, when you reach the Village of Calm, or eventually enter somewhere like Cosmo Canyon, you feel this sense of boundless unknown, because Shinra made it feel like that's all there was to the world. The upper plate of Midgar that blocked out the sky above the people of the slums was also blocking your ability to see the bigger picture of Gaia as a planet, and as you visit each integral location you learn more about this world, the people in it, and your fight begins to be recontextualized to make you deeply care about what you're doing. Even something as early in the life cycle of Final Fantasy as Final Fantasy II has a deeply underappreciated sense of world building with scale that makes you give a shit about your party and their actions, as well as the supporting party members that join you across the game from plenty of different locations across the world. The devastation that the Empire has wrought and continues to wreak across the game is felt on such a real level, from main story events to just talking to NPCs in the towns. And that's all done through establishing the way that politics functions, how the people view the political battles, and the history of the world, as well as how your core characters find themselves within a very personal battle and rebellion against a tyrannical empire. Final Fantasy XVI manages to create a real sense of world, but it doesn't give you the entire picture right away. And it's clear their inspiration from the works of George R. R. Martin and the Game of Thrones television series has moulded how they approach this element of the game. How the prologue handles world isn't to bombard you with all the necessary information right off the bat, it's to give you bits and pieces that you put together yourself, and as the game progresses, you'll end up with a much larger picture of the world, and your place in it, very similarly to how Game of Thrones handles its world building as well. You don't get a big exposition dump at the start, you simply pick up how the world functions based on experience existing within the world. As 
Sansa and Arya go to King's Landing with Ned, your knowledge of the world expands from this tiny part of Winterfell to be much larger. You begin to learn about the people of this other city and how the royal family operates. As Jon goes to live with the Night's Watch, you learn more about their proceedings and what lies north of the Wall, and the same applies to all of the world building within that show. It's masterfully done, and it comes back around to the concept that the audience isn't stupid. They can piece things together incredibly well, and 16 plays on this concept so heavily. The core of the game is focused on character, and that's how it approaches its world building. It allows for you to pick up on little formalities, from simple customs to spiritual beliefs and military traditions, as well as the exploration of why war is so prevalent due to the need for crystals and their magic being something that makes this world go round, leading to the understanding of bearers and their enslavement. But ultimately, this is such a tiny part of a much larger world, waiting to be explored, and it's the fact that what we know is built up so organically through natural dialogue that makes it feel so exciting to explore. You don't feel like you're being spoon-fed information, you feel like you're exploring a genuinely real fictional world, and that is something that has always been key to Final Fantasy, and 16 seems to do it with ease. Not to mention the active time lore, which is just a nice little addition, allowing you to see a little bit of the background if you so choose, but that means it's not then shoved into the main story. You don't get these exposition moments throughout the main story, it's stuff that you can pick up on, or you can read up on if you want to, and I think that's a great balance. The core to Final Fantasy though, for me, and I'm sure most people will probably agree, is character. The driving force behind the most beloved entries into this franchise are the ones that focus heavily on characters, their relationships, the drama, and the growth of those characters. Final Fantasy XVI's prologue is oozing with character in all of the best ways. Clive is someone who I wasn't too sure of before the opening of this game. I thought he'd be cool, I mean, he looks awesome in his general design, but on a character front, I wasn't sure if we'd be left with another typical brooding badass character without too much going on. But that's absolutely not the case. From Clive's interactions with his father and mother, his handling of the situation with a bearer and slave master, his affection for Jill and his clear care for his brother Joshua, we are painted a such vast and detailed picture of who Clive is, and the events of the prologue clearly a key to moulding him into the person he will be for the majority of the game. One of the most interesting parts of the prologue is how they make us care for a majority of the cast, and in the same instance, kill nearly all of them. Clive and Jill and Torgal are the only three characters who make it out of the prologue alive, and one of them is a fucking dog. And uh, don't get me wrong, I mean, I love dogs, but I mean, dog's not going on an arc, is he? And that's one hell of a brave move, to put this amount of legwork into making us care about these people, and then simply tear them all away. It's more than just powerful, it's a statement. It's saying, we have the ability to do this, and so we just fucking will. You'll have to find new characters to invest in, but better yet, it brings us closer still to Clive. The relationship between both Clive and Joshua is central to the prologue, and the ending of the prologue really gives us the reason why that's the case. We spend a good amount of time exploring the dynamic between the two, the care Clive has for his brother, and the reverence Joshua has for Clive. It's so sweet and endearing, but not just that, it's real. You feel it because their interactions are just so real and human, and it creates such an easy, empathetic connection between the audience and the characters. To get what is essentially a slice of life before shit hits the fan, it allows for you to feel a close connection to people you've never met, and when the quality of the writing and performance is on the level that it is in this prologue, that connection strengthens tenfold. The biggest thing about character, though, is something I talked about in my video on Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'll link it below if you want to check it out. The characters and how they interact with varying scenarios is deeply relatable because it's just how people act. We get to see how Clive speaks with Joshua, compared to how he speaks with Jill. Compare that to his relationship with his father or his mother, or how he speaks with Murdoch, or even when trying to lead Tyler and Wade on the mission in the swamp. By showing us how Clive acts around different people and in different scenarios, you build out a much more rounded picture of a character. We as people act differently when we're around different people or in different groups of people or in different places. We alter the way we present ourselves because that's just how human beings are, and Clive does this too. 
By doing this, we're able to grasp a greater understanding of how he thinks and feels, the motivations that drive him, his insecurities about not being good enough, being subconsciously jealous of Joshua while also loving him deeply, and a lack of confidence in his own abilities due to the treatment by his mother and the rejection by Phoenix, which ultimately chose Joshua instead. All of these elements work in tandem to craft a well-rounded and interesting person that is Clive Rosfield and the same can be applied to all of the characters we see during the prologue. With Elwyn and the way that he speaks and commands his men is different to the way that he tries to speak with Joshua, or the way that he communicates with Clive in private, or the argument that we see with him and his wife. The way Jill interacts with the whole group of them compared to how she acts when she's just alone with Clive. Or with Joshua, seeing him with everyone, how he reacts to his mother, how he speaks to his father alone, or how he confides in Clive. We are granted these beautifully executed snippets into the lives of these people, and it makes what happens by the end that bit more impactful. Because the events that occur aren't just events for plot reasons to get the story moving, they're there to get the character beats moving as well. The crescendo of this prologue is when everything they've done thus far, all of the world building and character work and storytelling comes to a head in a moment of just pure unfettered agony delivered through a presentation of absolute majesty. This is one of the greatest sequences I've ever played. It's not even that complex mechanically, but there's a certain level of grandeur that carries the emotional weight and narrative context that it can't not be impressive. This is using the full power of the PlayStation 5 to deliver on the building blocks that they'd spent the last hour and a half placing with such care, and that to me is a bloody beautiful thing. Watching the stakes rise, the fight with the Dragoon, the death of those close to us, the summoning of both icons resulting in the death of allies, seeing Ifrit and Phoenix go toe to toe in what is an intricate dance of a battle that you get to take part in, the scale of it all, of the destruction and loss, and then ultimately what follows it. Clive screams out in what is nothing but desperate and helpless anguish as Ifrit beats down and kills his brother, before decimating all of Phoenix Gate. And of course, the added layer to this entire sequence is that it seems clear Clive is in fact Ifrit. Not in the same way as the other dominants, of course, he's not aware. There's clearly more to this situation that we don't fully understand, but it seems clear as day by the framing of this scene, the different elements established, the loss in place, and the way Clive ends up viewing the final moments that spell out clear as day. Ifrit awoke from within him perhaps as a representation of his insecurities, of his jealousy, of his perception of his own failure, but whatever caused it also caused this destruction, and it's something Clive will have to grapple with. Or, that's my interpretation anyway. Where this leaves us after the reveal that it was orchestrated by their mother is in a place of deep and certain motivation to press on. We want to see why this happened, we want to confront the person and the people responsible, and we want to see the arc this leads a complex character like Clive to go on. It's perfect. It's a perfect opening to a video game. It sets up everything, and it does it with an incredible amount of style and prestige worthy of the name Final Fantasy. This game has become a must-play for a reason, and it's all because of this incredible prologue. I'm not sure what sort of content I'll make on the full game, but if there are moments on the level of this, then you can bet your ass that I'll probably end up writing something for it. But regardless, I'll be posting reactions and thoughts and content over on my second channel, which has become something of a Final Fantasy channel for me. So if you want to subscribe over there, feel free. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. I wasn't originally planning on making this, but I played the demo and I couldn't not. I just couldn't not. I had to do it. And I had some free time and I, I wasn't working on anything. All my projects were done. My Final Fantasy IX videos were up on It's Lasboy. Like there was, there was nothing more for me to do. So I was like, fuck it, we've got a few days before 16 fully releases. Let's write this out. Maybe this video will come out before release. Maybe it'll come out the day of or the day after release. I'm not really sure, but regardless, I'm very much looking forward to Final Fantasy 16, and hopefully there's something in there that provokes me to make another video, potentially.
Thank you again so much to my patrons for all the continued support. We've had a few new patrons since the last couple of uploads, and I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for, for hopping over there, and, and, you know, whether it's dropping a dollar or dropping more than that, because we've had, you know, a few higher-tier patrons too. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that support. It, it really does help me to spend more time creating things like this that I just really care about and want to talk about without having to worry too much about the financial complication uh, of that too. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, to, to all of you. Thank you to all your patrons, and thank you so much to my Patreon producers and Master Assassins. Cabbage, Ethan, Arenathon, Carl Frederick Rubro, Conocido Sam, Damien the Not-So-Orange Gnome, Flash Paradox, and TJ. And that's it from me today. Um, big projects will happen soon, I I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure I'm doing my GTA video. I've been trying to mod it, and it's just, it's, it's, it's fallen apart. Um, so there's that that's might just not happen now might just do red dead uh we'll see i'm not too sure but i'm gonna be kind of like out of commission for a bit because 16's coming out i'm just gonna be playing 16 so who knows it's time to switch off and just fucking do some fucking gaming like there's not been a release like this for me for a long time so i'm just really looking forward to doing that but hope you're all well stay safe and i'll uh, see you soon for something else thank you everybody Bye bye